Hello students, welcome back to the class on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. So today we'll move on to lecture number three, individual in organization, the building blocks. So before moving further, I would like to recap what we did in the last few lectures. We looked into what an organization is. We try to understand it's not mere group that is an organization. We also understood what behavior means different facets of behavior. We also try to understand how organizational behavior as a discipline has emerged over time. We looked into different perspectives over the years. We also looked into the approach which we use for organizational behavior to be captured. For example, we looked into the systematic approach. We looked into the evidence-based management coupled with the gut feeling or the intuition. We also looked into how organizational behavior has evolved over the time period with respect to different movements and finally the birth of OB. So today we'll address the critical issue, the individual in the organization, which is the building block of any organization. In the coming lectures, we'll stress on the, the, the relevance of individual differences. I'm Dr. Abraham Sillisek, Assistant Professor, School of Business, IIT Guwahati. Now, as I start any of my lecture with a quote, as you already know by now, or a phrase, today's quote is, it is not easy to replace. Whenever we look into situations where organizations are thriving, organizations are flourishing, we understand that individuals happen to be the key fundamental block of any organization. So it is not easy to replace anyone and that is a theme which with, with which we try to start our lecture today. Now, let's start with the situation. I have taken this uh, from the textbook. So, the reference textbooks will remain the same, McShane as well as uh, the uh, Judge Robbins as well as different Indian contexts also I put into in the OB books. The doctor is ill, but we'll see you now. Most physicians urge sick patients to stay home, yet few take their own advice. Three quarters of New Zealand doctors working in hospitals say they went to work while unwell over the previous year. Approximately the same percentage of Swedish doctors recently surveyed admitted that over the previous year they had gone to work one or more times with an illness for which they would have advised the patients to stay at home. Presentism is the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk or to do anything about, such as Michael Edmund, an executive and physician at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinic. It is difficult for medical centers to find a replacement in a very short notice and many doctors feel guilty letting down their co-workers and patients. There is an unspoken understanding that you probably should be on your deathbed if you are calling in sick, says an attending physician at a Philadelphia hospital where 83% of the doctors admitted working while sick within the past year. It inconveniences my colleagues is complicated to pay back shifts and make me look bad to do so. So this is a critical situation which I have reproduced from the textbook which says or which warrants the attention of organizational behavior theorists or students of organizational behavior management that when doctors try to persuade someone to stay at home, they are themselves uh, forced to come up. So this is what presentism is. Many a time as part of the discussion on counterproductive organizational behaviors, we tend to discuss something called as absenteeism, staying away from the work for some unknown time, uh, staying away from the work when it is actually very much critical or actually very much required. But presenteeism is totally opposite to that. You have to be in the job even if you are not doing well in terms of your health, in terms of your physical capacity or your psychological capacity, etc. So basically, this case shows us that it is not easy to replace anybody in an organization, especially within a short period of time. So this makes the organizational behavior relevant. This makes the individual within the organization all the more relevant. Now, let's understand this from a macroeconomic phenomena. Let's say you are uh, dealing with an individual who is the key part of a power plant commissioning project. Now, there is this boiler startup that has been designed for a particular date, designated for a particular date. Let's, let's take it as a date of, uh, uh, say, 10th December 2023. 
if you are looking into that day, then suddenly there are some key uh, departments that are functioning for that boiler light up day in, day night. Uh, they are working hard for every single unit, be it different uh, uh, auxiliary capacities like uh, the balance of plants or the BTG boiler turbine generator, etc. So, there is a big work that is going on focused on the particular date of 10th December. Now, interestingly, there is one individual. Let us name this individual Mr. X. Now, Mr. X is the sole authority in a particular department. Now, what he does is Mr. X has a, a habitual behavior that he puts his resignation paper the day before or, or, or in a very crit critical moment where just when it happens that it is just before the uh, boiler light up or any such critical incidents. Now, Mr. X as usual before the 10th December or 9th December uh, afternoon, he puts up his resignation paper. Now, interestingly, he is so irreplaceable that the organization will try to negotiate with this person and would try to accept and uh, agree to all his demands. Now, this is what makes the person critical. Now, let us take another example, um, Mr. Y. He thinks that he is easy, easily replaceable, he is just a casual employee, but he is very diligent, very meticulous in his job. But interestingly, there are some particular job which only he can undertake because his colleagues are so uh, prone to assuming that he will do the job that even if they are absent, Mr. Y gets it done. So, Mr. Y thinks that he is easily replaceable, but the moment he, let us say, by any chance he had a different assignment or he got, gets a different job, he, he presents the resignation of his job, uh, from his job at a particular moment, he is actually uh, canvas, he is actually talked into not to actually resign. So, irreplaceability can take different dimensions. As I have already mentioned, if you have, if you have listened to me properly, Mr. X happens to sit in one phase, Mr. Y in totally different phase, but both of them, they are irreplaceable. So, this is the core value of any organizational behavior management lesson that individuals, if they are marked or they are made the mark within the organization, if they are perform well, if they are uh, doing the task, if they are performing the task in a regular and clear fashion, they become irreplaceable and they become a valuable asset to the organization. Now, let us take a step back and look into the entire realm of organization very closely. Let us look into this Venn diagram. Organization comes as a bigger picture, then comes group, the, the, the core is individual. So, let us understand this, what is an organization made of? An organization is made of people, there is no doubt about it. An organization is not the infrastructure, not the, the fancy building that it is having in or not the, uh, the, the name or the fame that is being showcased in the website. Organization is made of essentially people, the core, the individual. What would happen if one individual starts giving more to the organization? This is where I, I brought in the example of both X and Y in both different contexts, but still they are all the more relevant to the organization. What would happen if out of 10 people, there are two individuals who are working day in, day night for every single activity of the organization beyond their calling of that particular job, which they are given, which they are paid for, they are taking more the effort for the organization. Now, what would happen if one individual starts questioning the principles of working of the particular organization. There are also individuals who are skeptical, who are always doubtful, who always think that, you know, somebody is monitoring us every now and then. Uh, somebody is breathing behind my neck every now and then. So, such individuals, they do have a certain level of paranoia where they are not able to pr produce or bring in their best game and also they tend to pull others down because they fear competition. They fear a uh, healthy uh, competition in sorts of their performance, they are insecure. So, there are individuals who are there who question the principles and working of the organization. It could be mainly because of two reasons. One, they are insecure in themselves. They feel that if, if this job is getting done, then somebody else is going to take credit and somebody else is going to make it big in the organization. Second important thing could be that the, uh, the person himself might not be having the competence 
the core competency might not be that. He might be interested in, in doing a different game in the organization altogether. He might be interested in performing a different task altogether in the organization. So that could be the reason why the individual starts questioning the very ethos and principles of working in the organization. Now, does one person's opinion matter in an organization where people are meant to serve collectively. This is interesting thing. Organization happens to be a collective scenario. It's a collection of individual. Now, whether there is one person emerging out of the whole scenario and dictating terms, is it going to be an autocratic system? It is going to that out of 10 people who got recruited in a, in a, in a batch, there is one individual who is dictating the terms and conditions. That also becomes critical for the organization. Does individual's behavior differ depending on the type and structure of the organization. We have already seen and underscored the fact that one individual in two different circumstances and two separate individuals in the same context, they perform differently. So time and again, I try to reinforce this statement for the simple reason that individual's behavior differ depending on the type and structure of the organization. Let's take a scenario where uh, an, an individual called uh, Mr. Arun comes into an organization. He is a very cooperative guy. He works in a very efficient manner if it is more of a democratic, participative sort of uh, organization. But unfortunately, what happens is that he lands up in a very autocratic system. He ends up uh, taking orders from single body and this creates a bit of cognitive dissonance in himself and he is unable to perform his job well. Whereas there is, uh, let's say, Hima, uh, she has come to the organization uh, thinking that what all the boss is going to say is right and what all the boss is going to say, I'm going to obey it in a perfect manner. So considering that she takes up the job very uh, meticulously, she does every single job. When it comes to participative or consultative process, she is not best, but she is good at taking orders and good at performing in an autocratic system. So it depends on the individual style. The individual behavior specifically depends on how you are performing based on your style of performance. Is it that the individual who influences the organization or other way around? This is a critical question. It could be both ways. Whether the individual coming into the picture is he or she more uh, influencing the organization or whether the organization is a larger entity which molds the behavior, which, which fine tunes the behavior of every single individual who is venturing into the organization irrespective of gender, irrespective of caste, creed, sex, race, etc. So this is also some of the pertinent question that we have to answer. Basically, the individual becomes the core encapsulated by the group and finally the bigger the bigger structure called the organization which encapsulates everything so what do individuals bring to the organization within the same structure let's look more closely into individual what does individual bring to the organization first no doubt you are being recruited, you are coming into the organization because you have specific skill set, a specific expertise and you bring a lot of fresh ideas to the organization, no doubt about it. That is the sole reason why an organization will recruit you in the first place. There is an diff altogether different level of skill set that the organization looked for. Let's say you are being recruited as a data analyst. You had good working knowledge with softwares like Python or you had good working knowledge or working experience elsewhere with respect to the tools that were required for the organization. You are being recruited, let's say another example for, a, for, a, for an academic institution. You had good experience of research as well as teaching. So, which made you the right person. That's the skill set you have. You, let's say you are uh, recruited for a job of a security. You are good in terms of your uh, understanding whether this person is having a bad intention. You have that intuitive feeling. Your expertise in, in, is in identifying whether he is the right choice coming in inside the gate, etc. You are recruiting a person for an a innovative uh, task or innovative job. So, he is full of creative uh, disposition 
position, he has shown that his creative acumen is far superior than his peers. His experience shows that he has been very good with different advertisements, etc. So that makes him or her the right person. So there's certain set of skills, expertise, and ideas which push you forward to the organization. Then there is a certain level of selection and perception that is making you the, the most suited person for the organization. Then comes personality. It could be anything. It could be with respect to your specific trade, like you are, you are extrovert, you are open, you are open to change, or you are agreeable, right? You are uh, receptive to different changes. So it's your personality that was generally noted in your interview, and you are into the organization for that. Then the values and attitudes. Values are the norms which you actually follow. Attitudes are learned enduring predisposition towards a set of object or people. So it could be changed, but with a different, with, with, a, with a, it's a Herculean task to change your attitude, but definitely it could be changed. But the point here is you have displayed a certain level of attitude. You have displayed a learned enduring predisposition in the, in the selection process and you are making the cut or making, uh, venturing into the organization because your attitude was deemed fit for the organization. There are certain expectations from you that seeing your resume, seeing your CV, your expertise, your, your performance in, in the previous organizations, your uh, research and learning experience, your qualifications, they all give that organization a specific set of expectations. This is what we are expecting from person X, person Y, person Z, etc. There is the level of curiosity that was that was deciphered in the interview when you were actually interviewed. That curiosity makes you the person, the person who is fit for the job. And obviously cultural dispositions, it could take any turn. We'll look that in detail in the coming modules. But to put things into perspective, Cultural dispositions can be anything. It could be with respect to how you, you see uh, uncertainty, how you see a leadership, how, how power distant you are, how you are different or how you, uh, you whether you are more uh, casual with the, with, the, with the authorities or you are more um, hesitant to talk to the authorities. It could be with respect to the restraint you are putting in. It, it, it could be with respect to the gender based disparity you are having. It could be based with respect to national cultural phenomena like collectivism or individualism. Are you more individualistically driven? Within a collectivistic scenario, it is common to have an individualistic person. Within an individualistic scenario, it is common to have a collectivistic person. It is not a, a watertight scenario, but again, most of the individualistic scenario or individualistic culture will try to breed individualistic orientation within the people and that is the fact. Now, cultural disposition. So, these are the different aspects that make individuals bring to organization. Out of this, if you want to pick one, it is very difficult because it is, it is a collection of all these virtues that make you bring or make you come to the organization. Now, the most important thing that in, if you look into any recruitment process, any selection process, is the person job fit. So what makes you the person, if you look into the individual as the building block within an organization, it is the person job fit. I would repeat the person job fit. Person job fit. Now person job fit is interesting. It is the alignment between an individual's characteristics and the requirements of or the demands of a specific job. Now, there are two aspects. One is individual's characteristic. It could be anything from the personality. From the previous slide, if you try to bring in your knowledge, the, the specific expertise, the specific personality, the cultural disposition, these individualistic characteristics are endless. And the requirements and demands of the job. So there is a set A which uh, details on the individualistic characteristics and there's a set B which details on what the job demands. If A matches B, you are the right fit for the organization. So this is specifically person job fit. Degree to which an individual's skills, abilities, values, interests, personality traits match the requirement of characteristics of a particular job. Now this is what 
dictates whether you are a right fit for an organization. Now, strong job person fit establishes that you are the right person, you are selected for the job, you, are perf you will perform also well. That is the assumption that comes with a strong person job fit. But what is interesting is the consequence of strong person job fit is higher job satisfaction. Higher job satisfaction, better job performance and greater overall well-being. So these goes hand in hand. If you look into a person who is who has matched his skills and abilities with the job requirement, he is satisfied. No, no, the organization is satisfied. Person A who has ventured into the organization, both of them are satisfied. Naturally, it leads to job satisfaction. It leads to better job performance because you are here in an organization which has taken you seeing your the abilities which you are actually able to perform without any doubt in a top most efficient manner. So this makes, so this makes your uh, predisposition or your existence in the organization vital very critical and also it gives an overall well-being so well-being can be defined here in terms of your work-life balance you are you are so skilled you are so fit for the job that it's let's say the timing is let's say nine to six you are able to complete the job at five and you are able to go out so this gives you more time with your family it enhances your work-life balance. It enhances the relaxation period you can get. So these are certain aspects which a person job fit with a maximum person job fit can bring in to the organization. Now there are other factors like skills and abilities which are also just scanned through. When an employee's skills closely align with the job's demand, they are likely to excel in the role. When in, in the coming modules, we look into the power and we'll specifically look into a dimension called as expert power. But to put things into perspective here, where employee skill set, you are being taken for a, a design and you are a master of designing softwares, which is actually the requirement and which is the very basic reason why the organization took you in the first place your skills and abilities match, no doubt about it. I've also mentioned about personality fit. Let's look into personality fit very deeply. A good person job fit considers whether an individual's personality traits. Let us take the example of introversion or extroversion, conscientiousness or risk-taking propensity align with the job's requirement. An example is a role requiring extensive teamwork. Let's say, Teamwork is the key for that job. May benefit from employees who are more extroverted or cooperative. You're putting a very introvert person and thinking that he will develop himself within a group context. It is a, a lost cause. You have to take the right personality character to fit in for a team job. You have to see that he is cooperative. He is extrovert. He is able to express his ideas explicitly. He is, he is able to bring out his ideas even though there are some individuals who, have, who are flushed with ideas but they are not able to bring that out clearly in a very uh, concise and explicit manner. They will not be the right choice for a group task or a team task. So that is what personality makes it critical. You are looking for a person who is having, who is supposedly work in an extensive uh, teamwork uh, based job task, then you have to look into a personality who is more extrovert, who is more cooperative. Then comes values alignment. This is also critical because uh, mainly if your values is not getting aligned with the organizational values, you tend to be a failure. Let's look into it more deeply. Values represent an individual's core beliefs and principles. When an ex employee's values specifically align with the organization's values, as I already mentioned, the values implicit in the job, they are more likely to find meaning and purpose in their work. So this is what makes them critical. My value within the organization, I carry certain value. If that is in counter purpose, that is in cross purpose with the, the existing values of the organization, then I might not be the right fit for the organization. I look into the interests and passions in the similar way. Individual interests and passions play a vital role in job satisfaction and engagement. When employees typically have a genuine interest in the type of work they do, 
and the type of work they do, they are more likely to be motivated and perform well in their roles. Similarly, if you look into the environmental fit, this is also a very critical aspect, not only the psychological fit, you have to look into the physical fit as well. The physical and the environmental aspects of a job can also influence person job fit. Let's, let's take an example of a person who is having a history of allergies, may struggle in an environment with poor air quality. Similarly, who is not having, you know, uh, there are some jobs which require good finger dexterity, right? So such people will only excel in those jobs. So you have to have a person vetted on the environmental fit also to understand and underscore the person job fit. Another aspect is career goals and longevity. Let's take uh, uh, an individual's career goals and aspirations is, is key for important, uh, is key for a person's good uh, person job fit. If a job aligns with an employee's long-term career objective, say as an individual, I tend to see that my career objectives is, is there in this particular field and I am at the right point in this organization and every single promotion, every single uh, development within the organization organization is going to uh, check all my check boxes or tick all my check boxes in my career, then I am at the right fit. I see myself as the right fit. I see myself that my values, my, my career goals and longevity is being satisfied in this organization. Fit over time is yet another important aspect. Person job fit can change over time. So this is not, not something which is constant. This is not something that is cast in stone. Your person job fit can change over time. It could be with respect to both the sides. It could be with respect to the expectations, the organizations. They might change suddenly. There might be a leadership change that's happening in an organization. There might be a change in the vision and mission. There might be a change in the objectives of the organization. So you tend to become obsolete in that organization. Or there could be another reason that you might feel suddenly that this job is not the right job for me. I have better skills somewhere else or I have developed or acquired skills that can suit me to serve some other organization in a much better way. That could be another, another problem in fit over time. So it changes the job requirements, individual growth and evolving organizational goals. All tend to, all these factors tend to contribute for the fit over time. Now, to look into individual qualities which are dynamic and subject, subject to change under different contexts, let's look into developmental change, experiences, environmental factors, learning and adaptation, person, environment, interaction. All these determinants are very critical when you are looking into the dynamics within an organization. This can make you uh, fit or make you an unfit to the organization. Critical to understand that individual dynamics within the organization are all governed specifically by these factors, which could be put under the umbrella of person job fit. So individuals, when they act as the fundamental block of an organization, one thing has to be clear that they are the right choice for the right job. If they are not the right choice for the right job, it will not take much longer for them to jump the ship. It will not take much longer for them to change their priorities. It will not change them much longer to change their efficiency or change their effectiveness within the organization. So with that, We'll try to end this session, look deeper into individual differences and individual as the critical element of organization in the next session. See you all in the next class. Thank you. Bye-bye.